to the second panel this evening. Thank you, um, thank you for your time and attention. Um, this panel is going to look at how narratives of fear and insecurity are being mobilised around the world in contemporary culture. Um, and we're going to focus in particular on the issues of geopolitics and militarisation. But we're going to also kind of hope to move beyond um, a conversation that only focuses on the terrible situation that we find ourselves in, uh, to also think about the kinds of ways that we might um, contest or reinvent or indeed move beyond those narratives around fear and insecurity. So to do that tonight, we've got three fantastic guests. Um, and allow me just to very briefly introduce all three of them. Um, similar to the last format, each of these uh, Panelists will present briefly some ideas and provocations, and then we'll move into a discussion amongst the panel members. So to my right, we have um, Professor David Vine, who is a professor in anthropology at the, Amer at the American University and author of Base Nation, How U.S. Military Bases Around the, uh, sorry, Abroad Harm America and the World. And David's comments, I think, will focus primarily on the issues of militarization but probably also expand well beyond that. Um, on the other end, we have Wei Ching, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Microsoft in China. Um, but tonight he joins us as a Chinese national and someone who has over 20 years' experience working in the technology sector. And to my um, immediate left, we have uh, Valeska Teixeira Martins. <laughs> I'm not, I, I don't know if I murdered that or not. Perfect. Yes, no okay. Um, uh, who who um, is well known for having served on the defence team of um, former Brazilian President uh, Lula da Silva. And she's also the co-founder of an organisation called the Law Founder, uh, sorry, the, the Lawfare Institute. Um, so, so bringing the perspective of the law uh, to this conversation. So, uh, please make them welcome. <laughs> and David, we'll throw to you uh, to kick the conversation off. Great. Hola, hola a todos. Good evening, everyone. I am extraordinarily excited to be here and feel really very lucky to have been invited. And I'm looking forward to all the conversations tonight and, and over the course of the entire weekend. Uh, to exchanging ideas at this, you know, critical moment that I think the first panel spoke to well. Um, I do want to say a few quick thanks. Um, thanks to the audience, everyone in the audience, to uh, Tristan Torrejon, Mercedes Bellavista, Rafael Eber, um, and Wada, Kanaf, Wada Kanfar in particular, um, as well as the whole staff here, the AV folks, um, and to the Chagosian people who uh, were the exiled people from Diego Garcia who are part of why I have a career. Um, but let me first bring you greetings from the belly of the beast from my city, Washington, D.C., the capital of the Empire of the United States of America, and uh, greetings from President, at least for the moment, President Trump. Um, haven't spoken to him deeply. I, I, when, I'm, when I'm abroad, I often feel like I have to apologize to, um, for President Trump. Uh, but here, I, I actually I think have a, a deeper apology to, to offer as a, a, as a US citizen. Um, at, a, at a conference about global security, I think I can't go any farther without apologizing for, for the obvious, what Martin Luther King said in describing the US government as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And it seems hard to argue with that, given the, the record, especially of the, the post-September 11th, 2001 wars. Um, so I uh, have to admit the, the great deal of the violence, war, and insecurity in the world today is due to the actions of my government that my taxes pay for. Um, now, focusing only on these wars, I do want to point out that uh, there was a recent report released last week uh, by the Cost of War Project, and using their data, I estimate that 3.1 million people likely have died that is, civilians and combatants on all sides, 3.1 million people, civilians and combatants on all sides, have died in the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, 
Syria, Pakistan, and Yemen alone. And the United States has been fighting in at least 22 countries since 2001. So that's just uh, four, uh, five of the countries. Um, tens of millions likely wounded, traumatized, uh, 12.5 million displaced in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen. Um, and that doesn't even count the other countries in which the United States has been fighting. Um, the numbers get so large, they become fairly numbing, I would say. Um, we lose sense of what, you know, what it would mean if, if we haven't ourselves been directly affected by these wars. We lose any sense of what it would be like to lose a child, a parent, a partner, any loved one, um, when we hear numbers like 3.1 million people dead. So, I'd like to do two things in the time, three things in the time that remains, I'll do them quickly. Um, one is, is to point to what I see as some of the serious dangers in the world. Um, I think there are reasons to be fearful. Uh, I don't want to engage in any sort of fear-mongering uh, scare tactics um, at this conference, but I think there are reasons to be, to be worried, and I'm going to point to some dangers related to the construction of a huge number of U.S. military bases around the world. Um, and the, the danger of even more catastrophic wars uh, facing the world. Second, I want to point to some encouraging signs from anti-base movements and from people, a growing number of people opposed to war in the United States and I think around the world. And third, I want to leave everyone with what I see as 10 suggestions, 10 policy pro proposals, 10 counter-narratives, alternatives, uh, that I hope are of some use to people in the audience. So let me explain um, some of the, the, the fears I have and some of the dangers I see um, by, by actually transporting us about 400 kilometers south to Moron, Spain, uh, near Sevilla, um, where there is a U.S. military base. We might start by asking why is there a U.S. military base in Moron, Spain. Why is there a U.S. military base in Spain nearly 30 years after the end of the Cold War? Does Spain have any enemies? Is Spain worried about a Portuguese invasion? Maybe Andorra? <laughs> the short answer is Africa, as to why there is a base in Moron in particular. The more complicated answer involves economic, political, and bureaucratic reasons. But it is important to point out that the United States now maintains around 800 military bases on other countries' soil, 800 bases outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C., in about 80 other countries and territories. And the United States has maintained even larger numbers of bases going back to World War II. Um, but this collection of bases has actually spread since the end of the Cold War. There were about 1,600 bases in 40 countries at the end of the Cold War. Now that number has shrunk to 800, in, but has grown in the number of bases. The breadth has grown to 80 countries. This has been a major tool of U.S. power over much of the globe since World War II, often overlooked. Um, since 2002, the United States has been building a growing number of mostly small, but not all small, bases across the continent of Africa. In approximately 75% of the countries in Africa, there is some form of U.S. military base or installation of one kind or another. The justification for these bases has been to provide security, of course, to counter terrorist groups, uh, to provide peace and security, uh, the track record, unfortunately, is quite to the contrary. These bases have largely undermined peace and security. Uh, a whole range of research shows. Uh, the Oxford Research Group has concluded about the efforts of the U.S. military in Africa. Governance and human rights are considerably undermined by the current, current securitization of policy. Uh, an article in one of the U.S. Army's own journals concluded the U.S. militarization policy in Africa has backfired, undermining the attainment of its own strategic objectives. The same is true of the larger war on terror, I would argue, which has largely succeeded in producing 
more who would use tactics of terror. Now, the second concern, I'm concerned about the destabilizing effects of these bases in Africa, but my even larger concern is that the U.S. military and the U.S. government has been pursuing an even larger and more lethal strategy in increasingly surrounding China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea with U.S. military bases, bases that are much larger than those found in Africa. And again, U.S. leaders have been using Cold War fear tactics, I would argue, to justify building up the U.S. military presence, uh, especially to control, to control or attempt to control the growing economic power of China in particular, and to a lesser extent, Russia. U.S. officials, of course, insist that all these bases are defensive in nature, uh, that bases in East Asia and Central and Eastern Europe are there to merely ensure peace and stability. I can pretty well assure you that Chinese, Russian, Iranian, and North Korean leaders don't quite see these bases that way. They don't see U.S. bases encircling their borders as defensive. And given the record of the U.S. military invading other countries, they have, I think, a very good reason to be fearful. So it should be no surprise that China, Russia, Iran, and, South Co and North Korea have responded in kind by boosting their own military spending and military activities, nuclear developments among them. Um, and I think we can only imagine how U.S. leaders would react if China or Russia were to build even a single base anywhere near U.S. borders, a single base. And meanwhile, there are literally hundreds of bases surrounding the borders of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Now, uh, the, the most dangerous part of this development, I would, would argue, is that this proliferation of bases, as well as air patrols, military exercises, and the like, risks actually creating the threat that they're designed to protect against. They, they risk becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy, and far from making the world safer, they, U.S. bases risk making war more likely and the world far less secure. And the, the risks of this, given the nuclear arms that most, if not all, of these powers possess are hard to comprehend and might make 3.1 million deaths look like nothing. Um, I think we can find inspiration from social movements that have challenged U.S. military bases abroad. In more than 30 countries and territories since World War II, social movements have blocked the construction of bases or the expansion of bases or won significant restrictions on U.S. base operations. Many in Spain surely know about the successes in the 1980s in forcing the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Torrejón and uh, just outside Madrid and Zaragoza. Um, I also think we need to recognize the success of the global anti-war movement. Many argue that the anti-war movement that sought to stop the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 was a failure. I disagree. I disagree. I think it was not a failure. I think the anti-war movement against the war in Iraq and the protests against the war in Afghanistan actually helped move public opinion much faster than in any U.S. war in U.S. history. U.S. public opinion turned against the war in Iraq and then in Afghanistan faster than ever before. Um, and I think this shift and the catastrophic outcome of these wars that people have started to realize uh, has meant that for at least a decade, U.S. politicians, U.S. leaders, presidents have been unable to launch a major ground war anywhere. Um, I think it's also important to note that opposition to war has spread across the U.S. political spectrum. Everyone from, yes, Donald Trump to at least six of the Democratic candidates for president has come out opposed to what are increasingly being called in the United States the endless wars, the endless wars. Um, 
Clearly, the U.S. military has found other ways to fight and deploy its military forces, but I think this is a significant development. To move quickly, uh, I want to conclude with these 10 policy, pro policy proposals, counter-narratives, alternatives, suggestions that I hope are, are of some, some help. I'm going to move very quickly. First, again, I think we need to focus on preventing any war between the United States and any of its allies and China, Russia, Iran, or North Korea. And we have to do it by challenging the fear tactics that U.S. leaders and others are using to inflate the threat of these countries and to actually, again, make war more likely, make it something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Second, we need to close and withdraw military bases encircling China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea that are in, indeed ra only ramping up tensions. Uh, and this includes dramatically shrinking the NATO military base presence in Europe. Third, we need to close US and European and other foreign military bases in Africa, which are continuing to militarize the continent, fueling insecurity, not providing security. Fourth, we have to invest in diplomacy. This is obvious, I'm sure, to everyone in the room, um, but everywhere we de decrease a U.S. military presence, we need to invest in diplomatic and other nonviolent forms of engagement. Fifth, foreign policy, policy should be focused on violence reduction and peace, and especially for the United States, given the catastrophe, catastrophe of the post-2001 wars. Um, how can our central foreign policy objective be anything other than focusing on violent reduction, violence reduction, I would argue. Sixth, we need to delegitimize war as a policy solution. War should not be seen as a legitimate policy option. Seventh, we need to reinforce the well-documented finding that war is not an effective response to terrorism. The war on terror has, again, created more people who would wish to use terror as a tactic. Eighth, we need to call exorbitant military spending, as the military spending in the United States is, we need to call this military spending what it is, which is a theft, to quote former President Dwight Eisenhower, former five-star general Dwight Eisenhower. The United States, by next year, will have spent $6.4 trillion, $6.4 trillion, that's about 5.8 trillion euros, that's trillion with a T, that's 12 zeros, will have spent $6.4 trillion on the post-2001 wars. It's an unimaginable sum, and I think it should actually make us weep if we think about what we could have done with that money in addition to the lives lost and traumatized and da forever damaged. Ninth, we need to move military spending to an urgent global movement. As part of an urgent global movement, we have to move the money to the common good, to invest in improving human lives and especially to invest in a green energy economy to combat global warming and climate change. And tenth, especially for U.S. citizens in the United States, we need to focus on a reckoning with the human damage caused by our wars, with reconciliation, and with reparations. Thank you. And wow, you get extra points, David, for doing 10 takeaways in under three minutes. Well done. Uh, I'm going to hand to uh, Wei Ching. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, I'm so glad to be here. And because of my background as a technical guy, I want to provide some different perspective talking about the security from a technology point of view. First of all, I want to go back to the root of the security. If based on the like from Wikipedia, we, we know that security is a C cure. C is a result. Cure is anxiety. So really, is a, in order to achieve the level of security, we need to be without anxiety. <coughs> but as we know, 
in this world nowadays, regardless of which country you are, there are so many people is, <coughs> is with anxiety. The, the bottom reason is uh, we start to understand we don't know what we don't know. In fact, as a human being, if we know what we don't know, we will be calmed down and we will start to building this behavior of learning. That's so called why they call the lifelong learning to learn new things. Then we will know what's going on in this world. But the problem nowadays, from a technology point of view, as a technology officer, we see there are so many people, be it a government official, be it an enterprise senior executive, be it a general citizen, they just don't know what's going on. And uh, the media sometimes even give you uh, another negative push. If you open up the newspaper nowadays, every day we saw the negative news. They tell you, you are a loser. There's a digital gap. You will be out of your job because the machine is take over your job. But you see, the, you can see the battle between human and the tools, technology, or the cohesive relationship, relationship between human and tools has gone on forever. Give you an example. Uh, I believe there are many highly educated people in this room, right? And uh, do we know the cheapest calculator, how much does it cost? You buy it from online, say $3 or $5, you can get a calculator. Then, if I put a calculator here, and uh, with the highest degree of uh, civilized, educated human on, uh, down here, go for fifth root of seven. Can we calculate, can we win over a $5 calculator to calculate the fifth root of seven? No way. So that's the time we start to realize how we really think about the human versus tools, the technology as a tools. There is, a, I love the movie, right? There is a movie the, by Kubrick, the two, two, 2001 Space Odyssey. There's a famous uh, set, is the, the, I think the chimpanzee or the, the animals chew out the bone. That's the time the animals start to realize, oh, I can use the bone as a tool to do something else, which as an as a, like, organic body couldn't do. That's the fundamental belief and advantage of human versus other type of animal because we are intelligent, intelligent enough to know we are almost like the slowest moving uh, animal in the world. We are definitely not among the strongest. But why human on this planet, we rule the, like the, almost the whole ecosystem on the Earth because we know how to utilize the, the tools, the technology. So, to go on is, uh, I want to say the like, uh, prerequisite, a premise of to my sharing with you is, uh, one, I believe we all of us need to have some type of a paradigm shift. Albert Einstein used to say, you cannot solve a problem if your thinking level, your conscious level, is, is the same level of producing the problem. Right now, everyone in this room our knowledge base, our educational background, that's where bring us today. Then, do we fully believe we can solve the problem talking about today by the same level of understanding and the knowledge base we have today? And that, a perfect example just now, I think during the previous uh, panel, we talked about the data, like GDPR, which is a perfect right. So we are facing a serious, privacy problem, but we cannot just because we have a privacy problem, we underestimate the power of data. So I will reframe our challenge today. Instead of believe we have a privacy issue, I will see we have a fair usage of a data issue, which means if we understand the data is like a new oil, a new energy, a new food, instead of a fear of a data being misused, must well we change our paradigm to see whoever figure out a way to fair and equal use of data 
be it a person, be it a society or country, will be the next hero, next like a dominant power in the world. Uh, I came from China, so I start to see like a 200, 300 years ago. Just now, someone talking about the, the de- year of uh, 1785, I think. There is a signature moment in China history called 1792, I think. There is a British guy come to China, knocking the door to the emperor to say, hey, can we do business together? Can we bring in the advanced technology to work with you to make the common goods? What happened at that time? The Chinese emperor saying, no. That's 1792. Let's see what's happening after the next 200 years. But for the, like, we see the, the civilization change in the Western culture. We have a Middle Age, then we have the Renaissance, we have a religious reform, we have a enlightenment, then followed by industrial revolution. So that's a nature move because human nature, a human being at that time, we are very open. We know we don't know, we don't know a lot. So we are eager to know new things. At that time, China is as emperor, as empire, holding a different position. So we all see what's happening. But now we start to see it's turning opposite. You can see there are many things people might not agree with what's happening in China, but as a guy coming from there by working for an American company for the last 25 years, I start to see a huge difference. That's a mental difference. The people over there is very open. Maybe sometimes it's too open. That's a different, different story. But they are very open to everything. They dare to try everything. Then figure out what cannot be done, what can be done. That's the thing, I think, so that's why I say, first, we need to really change our paradigm to see, can we reset ourselves, maybe at the Renaissance time, or at the Enlightenment time. I think the people in this room, in the, in, here in Europe, they have gone through everything of it. But why not we could, couldn't drop our like, paradigm to see, can we go to another round of a Renaissance? Can we go to another round of Enlightenment? That's the first question. Second question is, uh, because the success of the past 300 years, after the Enlightenment, we tend to believe we can always have the right answer. So we, as a human being, we always chase for the answer without the capability of accepting if, happen, if it's happened that there's no answer, no right answer. We reset, we chase for the new set of answer. That's the second paradigm shift. So the third paradigm shift, I want to use like the Oriental wisdom. There are two fables, one from India, one from China. I think everyone in this room knows the fable of a blind person, blind people, and the elephants. I think we should keep that in mind. Are we in this room, everyone believe we know what the elephant is? Or we are one of the people who think, who thought we know the elephant, but we know just part of it. The, the tail as a rope, the, the leg as a trunk. Uh, so that's another paradigm shift we need to keep in our mind. If we reset our mindset, we may start to realize we really don't know what we don't know. Just now the calculator example is one thing. The data privacy is another thing. I'm holding a small device here. This is called Google Corel USB accelerator. This is an AI accelerator. You plug this into a small computer, very little power small computer, can turn both into a super powerful inference machine. Can help you to recognize things faster without sleep because we know we human being as a carbon-based calculator or computer. The computer is a silicon-based computer. We are running some, somehow different with a, di- with a difference, the uh, same with a difference. If we can understand how human calculate, another question I ask all of everyone in this room, do you really hear me and saw me, see me? Think about that. 
you are not seeing me at all. As a human, you don't have a capability, your brain don't have a capability to see anything. Your eye turns a photon into electron. So then your nerve system turns the electron, and this electron is a reflection of RGB and A, alpha. If anyone in this room you know, RGB represents the color. So your eye is able to, to turn the photon of RGB, red, blue, and green, into electron. And alpha is the lightness in, as a signal into electron. Then the cortex here calculates the electron into perception. So if we understand that, we will put all those things like, oh, you as human, you will be replaced by machine or what. That's, I think, in my view, as a technology guy, I think that's bullshit. But, but you will be replaced by what? It's not by a machine, but by a, another human who knows in and out of the machine. So just imagine a human understand the latest technology and the latest machine, this human will become the superhuman. I think along the history, there is a three major war battle happening during, I think, during the, the, the great explorer in the history. I think that either British force or Portuguese force or Spanish force to the South Africa, uh, South America, Africa, and I think in China, uh, people, the historian, and study that kind of battle, saying that's not a battle at all. That's slaughter. Why is it slaughter? On one side, people using the, the automated fireworks, the, 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 the gun, against people are using the, the, the so-called cold machine. Then it's not, a, it's not a war, it's a slaughtering. Just imagine we as humans in this room, 20 years down the road, if another group of people are holding the latest, this type of uh, inference machine, go against you, what will happen? It may, may not be as bad as a slaughtering, but that's a, a human, superhuman, go against human. That's what we see from technology world. So I know time is short. As a conclusion, I may suggest a few things. I, will, I think in the technology world, we already know. We don't know the answer. So today I came here. I don't think I'm, I know anything better than you guys. I just happen to know one part of the future elephants, but I don't know the whole elephants. So I'm sharing what I know So by hoping we can ignite it's a different thought to help everyone in this room to think differently. So at least all of us will be the human, a superhuman, and helping others to do the common good. One is uh, we need to forget about the fear. Fear is the least important thing we need at this moment. We need to have a courageous to learn new things, to know Every one of us will be able to understand how the new set of machines are working. Then we can be the next generation of human beings. So forget about fear. Second is uh, we need to study, start to understand we do have the digital gap. Let's face it. I think for me, I think I, my digital gap will be a little bit narrower than maybe many of you in this room. So I might have a, a, big, a little bit bigger tendency to crossing the chasm, to reaching the next stage. But I believe everyone of us need to do the same thing. And the next one is, uh, in order to really excel in this uh, dynamic, fast-changing world, I think we need to hold three principles. One is respect. Respect different background, respect different opinion, respect different country, because, because everyone is fair. I think the government official in China, in US, in Europe, they are human beings. If they don't know what they don't know, the first human reaction is fear. Once you are fear, you, what do you do? You protect. 
you will overreact. So don't fear, respect everyone. Second is uh, building this empathy. Understand different opinions, different backgrounds, and you know why people fear of you. US government might fear of China, might fear of Russia, Russia might fear of China, China might fear of uh, uh, US. Everyone, because we don't know what we don't know, so we all fear. Forget about fear. Let's be proactive, embrace the new, new thing happening. Then the last one, be accountable as a human being. Because data is risky. I have many friends working in the security world, computer security. They told me there are two different, different kinds of a computer security experts. Only two different kinds. One is uh, don't use any electrical de device. That's extreme end. Another end is uh, he d doesn't care about security because he knows the digital security, sorry, you don't have it because, because of the nature of technology. So once you know that, you have to accountable how to carefully use the digital technology for the common goods. So that's all from me. Thank you, Wei-Chin. <laughs> and Valeska, we're short on time, so I'll hand straight to you. Uh, so, um, thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for um, inviting, me. Uh, inviting me over tonight to talk about uh, the other part of the elephant. Um, <laughs> and um, perhaps uh, in, in, uh, in, in a complementary way, talk about the other war that's being perpetrated by the United States uh, against uh, um, uh, other sovereign nations. Um, the, we're t we have to talk about law. We have this redefined law and, and, and uh, rede rediscovered a new use of the law, which is the strategic use of the law to harm an enemy, to annihilate an enemy, any chosen enemy, whether it's geopolitical, political, commercial, and how this is strategic use um, is um, causing uh, corporate death, uh, be, uh, corporations are being sentenced to corporate death, um, sovereign nations and democracies are ending all over the world, the rule of law is also uh, threatened, and um, everybody now talks about what lawfare is. Uh, but what is lawfare? Lawfare is a, the injunction, the conjunction of two powerful words, law and warfare. So General Dunlap in 2001 decided he needed to, to, to create a bumper sticker name, which would immediately uh, be recognized by by citizens, and then its concept would be immediately uh, um, related to the, to the concept. So lawfare is just like warfare. It is uh, the use of the law uh, as a weapon of war. Um, it works just like warfare in different dimensions. Uh, first, the first one is strategic use of the law, is the, choose, uh, the choice of the jurisdiction, which is the choice of the geography. Just like in Sun Tzu, the, you know, the, the choice of uh, the battlefield uh, for many different reasons uh, in, 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 in the battle, uh, the jurisdiction is chosen carefully. It, it's chosen uh, because of social economic uh, uh, motivations in the region that, that you know that, that's going to judge your enemy. It is judged because uh, perhaps uh, it's geographic uh, and uh, um, strategic uh, uh, place, perhaps uh, um, in terms of agents that might uh, be able to uh, overturn certain judges and prosecutors. The second uh, uh, dimension is the law, it's the weaponry. Which, we which weapon are you going to choose to delegitimize, to demonize, to harm your enemy? Which law will you be using? Uh, and in our recent studies, the law that, ha that has been uh, the most used and the most harmful and most lethal is the FCPA, which is the Foreign Corruption Practices Act, along with FISA which is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and how it has been used uh, to first uh, uh, um, 
in, in FISA courts, which are courts made up of 11 judges, uh, which is, uh, works in sealed uh, uh, files and in absolute um, classified manner. Uh, everybody has a difficulty, uh, I think, have a, to you know, understand how FISA really, really actually works. Um, but the surveillance comes first, and that data from the surveillance, from this information warfare, is used uh, perhaps, and, and most likely uh, it's been used in Brazil and, and, and against, uh, 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 for instance, Siemens, in the Siemens case, to uh, originate FCPA procedure investigations, either in the DOJ, which is the Department of Justice, and the SEC. Once that, those procedures have started, the tactics actually follow the same tactics of war, which is intimidation, which is psychological torture, which in the end would make uh, executives of, of corporations uh, confess, or not confess, but actually uh, uh, agree to uh, anything that the prosecutors are saying, uh, an agreed pre-established script, which in the end would not, be, again, would not uh, contribute to the fight against corruption. So we, it's been happening in, in the United States for the past 30 years um, through the use of non-prosecution agreements, um, deferred prosecution agreements, and plea, proce uh, plea bargain agreements. This negotiated criminal justice, which runs in parallel to the judiciary, which has no scrutiny of the judiciary, is uh, actually uh, what has been used uh, to uh, harm uh, corporations and to uh, delegitimize uh, and to harm mainly Americans. Since the, 30, since the past 30 years have worked in terms of uh, this negotiated uh, penal uh, criminal justice, they decided, I'm sorry, well, the United States has decided to export the same methodology to other parts of the world. Um, what we have to understand in terms of legislation and law, it's that it's inherently uh, violent. The law, when misused, may take away one's reputation, it may take away one's uh, assets, uh, your freedom, and in some countries, your life. So if misused and is strategically used to harm one person, to harm an individual, uh, even a corporation, it might, it will result, result in very violent uh, and very violent results uh, and uh, in a lot of suffering and I can be a witness to that uh, and how it's been uh, used um, in my country, which is Brazil. Uh, the third dimension of war, of lawfare, is the externalities. Um, that's when uh, the information warfare comes in. Um, the media, how the media works with parts of the judiciary to create a sense of the presumption of guilt against the individual chosen as an enemy um, through fear, through hatred, and now with the velocity uh, of data and, and social media, um, they created a false, the creation of a false cause, which is corruption, uh, in certain cases, national security, um, in other parts of the, the, the world, uh, uh, immigration, uh, uh, fear. So it, it, how the fear is used, how hatred is used to create a smoke so that meritless actions, meritless procedures may be perpetrated and convict innocent people. That's what's been happening in Brazil. It's, uh, Brazil is what we like to say uh, should be considered a glimpse of what might be the future of the world, how we have actually destroyed uh, uh, our institutions, uh, a country that was developing um, with strong uh, uh, democratic values, um, always towards uh, meeting, you know, uh, compliantly with uh, basic standards of human rights, trying to, or at least evolving, uh, trying to advance in that, in that area. Um, and through this methodology, through this destruction of the rule of law, through this misuse of the law for destruction of the enemy, 
geopolitical, commercial. We have actually destroyed companies. We have destroyed it's kind of uh, uh, destroyed lives, um, caused a lot of suffering. Um, if you have an idea, if, if you, I don't know if you know, but uh, last year we had an election in 2018 where the uh, main opposition leader was removed illegally from the election, uh, which would have won, absolutely, uh, if he hadn't been illegally charged uh, on a, a false cause, a meritless cause, uh, case. Uh, in spite of two intermeasures granted by the United Nations, he was removed, and Jerry Bolsonaro, uh, again, and I have to apologize for him as well, uh, <laughs> so, uh, he was elected uh, president of Brazil. Uh, my, finally, the message here is we have, uh, a, a, we have also a small part of this huge puzzle. Um, but the idea is to study law affair, is to restudy the strategic use of the law, because the law was created, is, is, was used and is used as a social pacifier, social justice, and it should not be used as a weapon to destroy people, to bring in more uncertainty, and to, in the end, undermine all of the trust that, that citizens have in the in judiciary, and that undermines democracies all over the world. Fantastic. So um, we are very close to time, so we won't, uh, we won't pick this discussion up here, but I think you'll all agree with me that we've had three very interesting provocations around the themes of technology and the law and um, militarization, which will carry us forward um, into, into many conversations become, uh, to come. I, I, I do feel like, um, given we're in confessional mode, I should also <laughs> apologize for the Australian Prime Minister, uh, <laughs> who, of course, detains uh, refugees illegally on extraterritorial spaces. Um, uh, but anyway, but that's, that's something else we can talk about another time, too. Will you please just join with me uh, quickly in... in uh, thanking our three speakers, David, Valeska, and uh, Wei Ching. Mm.